In our last lecture, we talked about frequency response. In this one, we'll use that to understand how um, an interesting little device works. This device is called a vibration absorber, or sometimes called a tuned mass damper. And both of those names are actually not very accurate in terms of what it does. But hopefully through the course of the lecture, you'll get a better understanding of how this works. The basic idea is, suppose that we have a machine and, you know, maybe we have a spinning wheel on this machine or something so that we are exciting this at one frequency and we get large vibration amplitude at that frequency. So, for example, um, For example, if we consider um, the example from last time, our three degree of freedom system, if our excitation frequency was near one of the resonance frequencies, then we'd get a large vibration amplitude. And um, we could have noise, we could have damage to the component or something, any of those things we don't want. So um, a vibration absorber lets us deal with that. Okay, so the way it works is um, this rotating machine we can replace with just a force and um, this is a harmonic force, so we're, we have a force at a certain frequency. And the idea is to attach uh, another system to our machine, and we're going to try to tune that system to try to minimize the vibration of the machine. So to go through and understand this, we need first the equation of motion. So here we have the mass and stiffness matrices for, um, for this system. And we have the forcing on the right-hand side. And as we've done before, we can assume that the response will then be steady state. Uh, give, in steady state, we'll have the same form as the force. So the response will also be in a complex amplitude x e to the i omega t. And um, we just need to solve for x or the magnitude and phase of the response at the forcing frequency. So we do as we did before. We plug this in to the equation of motion. We get a minus omega squared on this term. We get that term. We put that all together. And here's our solution for the two complex amplitudes of our two coordinates, x1 and x2. Um, if we want to solve this by hand, we can use a neat little trick that says that the determinant of a matrix, a 2 by 2 matrix, can be obtained by just switching the order of those two terms, putting a minus sign on the off-diagonal terms, and then dividing by the determinant. So we do that up above, and what we get is that x1 and x2 is equal to um, this matrix times f, and this 0 right here will wipe out that whole column. So that simplifies down to just this simple expression here. And remember, the top is for the machine, the bottom is for this part that we bolted on. So now we see something interesting. This is the difference between two terms, right? So if we set that difference equal to zero, we can cause x1 to go to zero, or the amplitude of vibration of the first mass will go to zero and our machine sits still. So all we have to do is we solve that equation. Um, the frequency is equal to um, is equal to square root of k2 over m2. If we know the frequency, we can use that to figure out the ratio k2 and m2. And then we can set 
uh, use the constraints on the problem to either set k2 or m2. So that's uh, how this works. Um, here it is reviewed. Interesting to note that that natural frequency is the natural frequency of, a, of, a, of the attached system if we fixed its base to ground. So usually the machine would be right here. But if we replace that machine with a fixed base, then this is just a one degree of freedom system, and by inspection, the natural frequency is square root of k2 over m2. So uh, what we're doing is we're tuning our fixed, our attached system so that its fixed space natural frequency, the natural frequency of the fixed base is equal to the excitation frequency or the frequency we're trying to cancel. So um, so that's how that works. It seems like magic, though, and it seems also a little counterintuitive because um, as you think about this, let's go back to the picture. Oh. If we go back to the picture here, we're still applying a force here, right? that, you know, this F1 cosine omega t, that hasn't gone away. And yet somehow the mass stops moving. So how can that be? Well, we can, um, we can find the clue by looking at the second equation on the previous slide. So if we go back to this equation, the top equation let us set x1 equal to 0, but the bottom equation tells us that x2 will never be 0. So we can actually, um, we can actually use that equation to find x2. And as we plug in for the denominator and we simplify, what we get is that um, x2 is proportional to the force applied and the stiffness. And so x2 is moving in response to the force and the stiffness while x1 is sitting still. And if we look at this in a little more detail, uh, remember x1 is sitting still but we still have this applied force. If we plug in the motion x2, um, then it tells us that x2 is oscillating. And as it oscillates, it will apply a force, um, this spring, it will apply a force through this spring to the system down here. And so um, if we work out what that force is, we, that would be K2 times delta, or K2 times X2 minus X1. And we could check that the sign on that is correct. If x2 is um, positive, actually, that should probably be the other way around. Um, but anyway, if we um, plug in for x2, um, then uh, what we get, uh, what we get is that the force in the spring uh, ends up being just uh, F1 e to the i omega t. Or in other words, here we're applying a positive F1. Up here through the spring, we're applying a negative F1, and those two cancel. So um, the motion of the mass causes a force it through the spring that exactly cancels the applied force and that's how the vibration absorber can work. So hopefully that uh, makes sense to you. Um, here's an animation that kind of shows what this might look like. Um, it's a two degree, once we assemble everything it's a two degree of freedom system. So it'll have a first mode and a second mode of vibration and the first mode you know the masses move in sync and the second they move out of sync but at a frequency partway in between. So again, this would be at omega one, this would be at 
omega 2. But at this omega that we've tuned the vibration absorber for, we get um, mass 1 sitting still in the attached system vibrating and causing a force that counters the applied force. So a neat little phenomenon. So how would we use this uh, to solve a vibration problem? Remember the problem is that we have this machine, we're applying a forcing near resonance, and so we're getting um, a much bigger response than we want at resonance. So what we would do is we would then um, design an attached system and we'll put the natural frequency of the attached system right at this treble frequency. And after we do that, what we get, this two degree of freedom system will end up having two peaks and it will have a zero so that the amplitude of vibration in X1 goes to zero right at that frequency. And um, at mass 2, if we were to plot x2 versus frequency, we'd see that it um, doesn't have a 0. It's still moving when x1 is sitting still. Um, but anyway, the, I guess this is the key to understanding this vibration absorber. It hasn't absorbed the vibration, right? What, what it's really done is it's moved the resonances. So we took this single resonance that we had up above and we've split it and made it into two resonances. And so it's an interesting way to understand what happens when we take one system and we bolt on another flexible system. Or you could use this to understand also, you know, what happens to the modes of an, the body of an airplane if we bolt on a wing or um, an airplane when you ha with one wing and you bolt on a second wing. Um, these kinds of things happen there as well. Resonances move around. And so this has a more general application as well. We'll have some more on that in a minute. Before we do, um, let's just see an example in MATLAB. So, um, If we look at our script here, um, basically what this does is, um, is we define a two degree of freedom system. The base system has a natural frequency of one, and then the attached C frequency uh, system also has a natural frequency of one. So we keep these values equal. And then I've added in damping so that we can see what that does. Um, so um, we just define the matrices and use the simple formula that we've talked about in our previous lecture to find the transfer functions. And this gives us the response of masses one and two of this assembled system with the vibration absorber. We compare that with the transfer function for a simple one degree of freedom system, which is this equation that we've seen before. So if we run this, uh, what we get in the first case, uh, this yellow line is the transfer function we would have if we had only a one degree of freedom system, uh, the original machine, and we have a huge amplitude at, re at this resonance frequency one here. After adding the second system, we split that resonance into two, and now we have the anti-resonance. So this will now let us see what happens as we vary different things. The derivation that we did was all for zero damping. And um, you can maybe already see in the case of finite damping, the amplitudes at resonance are not infinite, they're finite. And similarly, the vibration amplitude, while it becomes really small at the anti-resonance, it doesn't go all the way to zero. So let's run a case where we make the damping a hundred times larger. I'll give it a different number there so that we um, can compare. Now if we compare these two cases, um, we can see that adding damping lowers the height of the peaks. So that's good because if 
the forcing gets off of this resonance that we've designed it for, now we're no longer going to run into these two modes. But it also raises the amplitude of vibration of the absorber frequency. So rather than getting 10 to the minus 2 amplitude, we get um, 10 to the 0 amplitude, so 100 times, um, 100 times larger. But it's still hopefully small. And anyway, the moral of the story is that when we put damping on one of these systems, we try to get a compromise between adding enough damping to keep the peaks low, but not so much that we ruin the absorber frequency. Um, okay, another interesting thing is how much mass do we have to add, or how heavy does our added system need to be? Ideally, we'd like to put a, a little tiny fly on there and have it absorb all the vibration. So what would happen if we take the mass and we make it way smaller? Well, if we do, we have to make the stiffness way smaller, and that has consequences. But let's just look at the consequences on the response. If we run this again, oops, I overrode that one, but that's OK. If we run this again now, um, with much smaller mass, we see that adding the vibration absorber doesn't move the peaks apart nearly as far as it did. Um, so rather than having a, a fairly wide range of frequencies that the absorber is canceling, now we have a very narrow range of frequency. And so it becomes less and less effective. And then if you add in damping, the amount of um, reduction in vibration you get is less and it becomes less effective. Also, because the stiffness has gone down, we're going to get a much bigger vibration of the mounted system. And so you might run into space constraints where that little mass spring is running into the walls or something like that. So anyway, that simulation lets us see um, what happens as we vary the parameters. If we um, change that even more, Let's say we um, let's say we add a lot of mass to the system. Well, then we can get an even better spacing, even more robust solution. You know, wider dead band, um, farther spacing. But we uh, so this way, if the speed of the machine varies, we'll still have good performance. But we've added more mass to do that. Okay, so that's the. Um, the MATLAB example, just a couple actual applications. Um, all cars, rear wheel drive cars, have to have a drive shaft or drive line that sends torque from the engine to the um, back wheels. And if you've looked under a big truck that's built, you know, fairly recently, you might see a drive shaft that looks like this. And it looks like a big beefy thing, though actually if you were to pull that out, it's actually fairly light. They've really optimized these for weight. It's a thin walled tube with some end plates. And because the diameter is big, it can transfer quite a bit of torque in a thin diameter. Uh, but, you know, a thin long tube is going to have low frequency modes of vibration and possibly amplify um, we could have resonances of this drive line that amplify torque ripple from the transmission or from the gears and that send noise into the vehicle. And that's definitely not something you want if you're trying to sell cars and convince people they're high quality. So interestingly, uh, what's done is that there are actually um, cardboard inserts inserted um, inside these drive lines that add a little bit of weight and try to add some damping and the vibration absorber effect, possibly. So um, if you just put cardboard in there, you just get a damping effect. But they actually put cardboard on little rubber stoppers so that you can tune the frequency of that, uh, of the cardboard being the mass and the rubber being the spring. So this just shows you some a test we did once on some drive lines. Um, uh, there's a bunch of measurements um, taken on the at different points and basically the short explanation of this is that there are lots of different resonance frequencies in a complicated system like this. Lots of different modes of vibration. 
and um, and uh, particularly in this cyan, you see some of the um, you see a bunch of frequencies in here. These end up being um, some of the ovaling modes, some of the bigger noise transmitting modes. Um, the next slide actually shows you what the different modes of vibration look like. So the here the um, drive lines bending kind of in the page. This one it's actually bending kind of out of the page. So in the previous slide it'd be coming out of the out of the screen at you. And then there's a higher order bending and higher order bending. And then finally those ovaling modes where the two sides of the drive line are bulging in the middle. Um, so anyway, if you were an engineer, you could decide um, where to mount some um, some tune mass dampers or some vibration absorbers to minimize vibration, right? So for this mode, you might put a tune mass damper right here inside the drive line, and you would tune its frequency to 104 hertz. Uh, out here, you might um, put it at these points, right, and tune the frequency to 175 or so on. And, um, you know, if you're really clever, maybe you can tune one, um, one insert so that it cancels lots of different modes. So anyway, that's an interesting application of this. Um, but this isn't relevant only to uh, machines and tune mass dampers. As I said at the beginning, this lets us understand kind of the vibration of any structure. So consider again these uh, micro, micro switches that I've talked about before. So it's a thin plate of metal that's suspended on four springs, a thin gold plate. And here you see it, um, when you actuate it, it moves up and down like this and comes in contact with this electrical wire and it transmits voltage uh, through the switch. So, um, and this also happens to be the first mode of vibration that where the switch moves up and down like that. So uh, if we actually look at a measurement from this is applying a force to the center of the switch and measuring on the center of the switch, we see peaks at the different modes of vibration. So this is the one you saw on the previous slide where the switch is moving up and down. Here's the second mode where the switch moves just a little bit but the, mostly it's the springs flapping around in that mode. And between those two, and actually very close to this frequency, is a frequency where um, there's an anti-resonance, or where the amplitude of vibration on the plate becomes practically zero. And you can infer that at that frequency, basically these springs are vibrating and they're acting like the attached mass springs that um, absorb them or that counter the applied force and allow us to have a zero vibration at that point. And these switches in vacuum are very lightly damped so you get a very sharp anti-resonance. And so um, understanding this lets us uh, understand kind of the naturally occurring features in a transfer function like this and a measurement like this. So that concludes our lecture on vibration absorbers. Hopefully that was interesting and uh, helped you to understand a few things about